I want to, I have the uh, privilege now of introducing S. Brian Wilson. He has been someone who all of us have re admired and respected as a peace activist for a long time. Brian is a Vietnam veteran. His life changed when he went to Vietnam. He has spent his entire life struggling for justice and for self-determination for people around the world. He is a great friend of Korea. He's been there six times. He's been to Palestine. He's been to Iraq. He was in, detained by the Colombian army. He was in Chiapas when the government tried to retake land from the Zapatistas. He is always fighting for justice for people everywhere. And we're very honored always to have him with us in Los Angeles. So please welcome S. Brian Wilson. Thank you for coming from Korea to share uh, with uh, uh, us here tonight. Uh, it's an honor to be with you uh, at this presentation. Uh, my motivation for uh, being involved in Korea has been the same motivation that has um, contributed to my being involved in many parts of the world where the United States has been uh, present either covertly or overtly. My life changed in April of 1969 when I realized that the United States was deliberately uh, targeting civilians in villages. I didn't want to believe it, uh, being a straight guy at, up to that point, but I um, then realized that this was happening uh, day after day um, in my observations as a security officer in the Air Force in the Delta. And uh, I have to confess that I didn't know much about the history of Vietnam, which was fairly typical, I'm sure. I went to the base library at Binh Thuy, uh, which is about 100 miles south of Saigon. We had a very nice Vietnamese librarian, and I asked her if there were any books about the history of the French and the US involvement in Vietnam. And she took me to this little shelf at the back of the library where there were about eight books, and I read three of them. And I was shocked to realize that I didn't know anything about the history of France and the United States in Vietnam. I didn't know that we invaded Vietnam. I didn't know about the, um, the peace that ended the French Indochina War in 1954 uh, was the dictated that elections would be held in 1956 uh, those elections were not held because the United States couldn't afford to allow the elections because Ho Chi Minh would have overwhelmingly been elected president and that was not acceptable to the United States. This was the beginning of my awakening. I was shocked. I was almost sick because I had been such a true believer. Well, as a result of that experience, I started studying the history of U.S. policy and U.S. history, period, and went back to the very origins of this culture. And um, in a sense, what happened in Korea and what happened in Vietnam, uh, two of the most uh, um, tragic um, experiences of the 20th century, of which there were a number of tragic, ex tragic uh, uh, episodes, Korea and Vietnam are two of the greatest tragedies Korea still being relatively unknown compared to Vietnam. Uh, but the defining and enabling experience of the American, what we call the US American civilization, um, was the way the Europeans, my ancestors, um, treated the indigenous who were here in the first place. Uh, that was our first experience, our first Holocaust experience, really. Uh, in that period of time from the late six, the early 1600s to the late 1800s, 95% uh, of all indigenous in North America were killed. 
um, and the same percentages of indigenous living in Latin America by Spanish and Portuguese conquistadors. So in a sense, the original experience of our civilization was based on a racism and a callous ethnocentrism that made distinctions between civilians and combatants almost uh, irrelevant because everybody that was considered uh, non-European was an en enemy or was expendable, was in the way. Uh, so this is a very deep part of our history. And then we had slavery, which was the second defining experience. So we stole the, we stole the land from the Indians and then we stole the labor from Africans. This is part of our experience. Our civilization has been built on this kind of attitude and the behavior that comes from that kind of an attitude. Uh, and it's, in my opinion, very important for us to understand this so that we have an opportunity to make a deep shift in our thinking, a deep shift in the way we look at ourselves and the world. In the 20th century, uh, the United States has sent troops or covert operatives to over 100 countries 400 times overtly and perhaps as many as 10,000 times overtly, covertly to destabilize popular movements. Korea happened to have gotten caught up in what we've called the Cold War uh, battles of ideology. But the United States had been involved in Korea as early as 1866, and again in 1871. Um, 1882, we signed a treaty with, a commerce treaty with Korea in which we promised to honor their independence. But then in 1905, we secretly, under President Roosevelt, signed the Taft-Katsura Agreement with Japan, giving Japan the, uh, promising Japan we would honor their uh, hegemony over Korea. This was a secret agreement that wasn't made public until many years later. Uh, for that, Theodore Roosevelt, as he was asked to mediate the Russo-Japanese uh, Russo War in 1905, the agreement, the secret agreement with Japan was made at the time and Roosevelt won a Nobel Peace Prize at that time in 1905. That was, that Taft-Katsura agreement was a a terrible blow to Korean sovereignty because unbeknown to the Koreans it promised that Japan would rule Korea and from 1905 to 1945 Japan did rule Korea five years as a protectorate and 35 years as a formal annexation. This was a this was a an assault on the dignity of, of Koreans so that relationship goes back uh, to the early part of the century and then when we have the Japanese defeat in 1945, uh, both Vietnam and uh, Korea, among others, celebrated on August 15th. By September 2nd, Ho Chi Minh was declaring the independence of Vietnam. Uh, at that time, the OSS, the predecessor of the CIA, four officers were sitting with Ho Chi Minh when he gave that famous speech in which he cites the Declaration of Independence as part of his motivation for articulating the Declaration of Independence for Vietnam, fully expecting the United States to support uh, the independence movement of the Vietnamese against the French. On, August, on September 6th, the people of Korea met in Seoul this was only three weeks after the Japanese defeat and created the Korean People's Republic, the KPR. This was on September 6, four days after the Vietnamese declared independence. On September 8, the U.S. troops came into Incheon and started the occupation, for which has never been really uh, lifted since uh, September 8, 1945. Uh, in December of 1945, the U.S military government that was ruling Korea, of course, none of, this, none of these decisions had been done with the consent of the Korean people the, at the uh, Yalta and Potsdam agreements, uh, uh, meetings that had been held in 1945. There'd been this tacit agreement between Roosevelt and Churchill that Korea would be considered um, something other than independent for a number of years. 
this again was this decision was made without uh, consultation with Korean people. Um, and in December of 1945, the U.S. military government of Korea made the Korean People's Republic illegal and all union activities and movement activities illegal in Korea. Um, that uh, was about the same time that the French were resuming their control over Vietnam. Um, so there was this alliance, in a sense, with the West, uh, alliance among those in the West that was not going to allow uh, popular movements to prevail in Asia. And by the way, the Taft-Katsura Agreement made in 1905 supporting the Japanese hegemony over Korea was a quid pro quo with Japan honoring our occupation of the Philippines, which we had uh, recently occupied during the Spanish-American War. It was kind of a quid pro quo. Um, so what I think is uh, very important to understand is that between 1945 and 1950, before the hot war started, the United States oversaw a re campaign of repression against the popular movement in South Korea um, that equaled or perhaps even surpassed what happened in Indonesia 20 years later in 1965. Uh, Perhaps as many as a million, but probably at least a half a million people were killed between 1946 and 1950, before the war even broke out. Uh, the uh, massacre at Jeju Island, uh, which actually was a series of battles between U.S. military officers with South Korean military and police and paramilitary against the popular movement of Jeju Island, uh, nobody even knows how many were killed, but the U.S. ambassador at the time privately estimated that as many as 80,000 were murdered in Jeju Island out of a population of 300,000. Uh, this was in 1948, 1949. Um, so between 46 and 1950, perhaps as many as a million were killed, but at least a half a million. And 48 and 49 and 50, there was an active guerrilla war going on in Korea. Uh, very few people understand that there was a there was a real war going on between the popular movement of Korea and the forces that the United States were supporting. Basically, the Koreans who had collaborated with the Japanese during the occupation became the administrators of the government of South Korea and became the new police force. And most of the officers in the ROC and the, uh, the the Republic of Korea Army uh, were Japanese. Um, so basically the colonization continued and the Korean people who had celebrated on August 15th in the streets, Hua Young being one of them, uh, as a child, um, only saw their, their uh, freedom for about three weeks before the United States arrived uh, with the troops. Up to 70,000 troops arrived within two months. In fact, the troops, when they, when they disembarked at Incheon on September 8th and for about a month, were protected by Japanese military riding horses, protecting them from the Korean people who were objecting to the U.S. soldiers coming into Korea. Um, so this, uh, this history, this assault on Korean dignity and Korean identity uh, it's very important to understand how deep this rage is. And what happened in 1950 in, in, in June, it isn't even clear exactly what happened on June 25th, because there had been, for two years, there had been battles going back and forth across the, the um, 38th parallel, uh, by the way, which was established by Dean Rusk in 1945 in a 30-minute meeting at the Pentagon, had quickly put together this line on August 11th, four days before the, uh, turned out the surrender. I mean, this was just a line that they uh, drew on a map, hoping that Stalin would agree to it. Um, so this, uh, this whole period was uh, reeked with um, the Korean people feeling so betrayed, as the Vietnamese people felt so betrayed 
by the promise of the United States, the promise of Wilson's 14 points, the Atlantic Agreement, the, the, Atlantic, the Atlantic Charter Agreement of 1945, which promised liberation for popular movements around the world. Uh, again, the people believed the rhetoric, but as the Native Americans have told us over and over again, the white man speaks with forked tongue, and the Koreans know this again, just like so many others have known it. Just as I discovered it, which was so painful for me to accept as a reality. Um, so what happened in 1950, and by the way, this book, The Hidden History of the Korean War, is a great, great book to begin understanding the history of Korea. I.F. Stone wrote this book before the war was over because he smelled a rat. And um, it talks about the fact that there were so many skirmishes going on at the 38th parallel for two years that anybody could have decided at any one time that that was it. That, excur that movement of troops across the 38th parallel was the beginning of the war, whether it was from the north to the south or the south to the north. And we have many statements now of, of U.S. officers who were concerned about Syngman Rhee's obsession with moving his troops into the north, trying to contain Syngman Rhee to, to stop um, a um, pro provocation that conceivably was going to lead to a hot war. So this guerrilla war was what the United States troops, when they arrived, they discovered there was a guerrilla war going on. There was already this festering feeling among the Koreans, and no wonder that a lot of the U.S. soldiers uh, had concluded that they weren't treated very friendly when they arrived in these villages in Korea. Um, it's very easy to understand once you know the history. Now, I have been to Korea um, six times. I've been to eight of these massacre sites. Um, this map on the wall here, you can't read it very well because of the way the light's reflecting on it, but it has a number of massacre sites identified on there, and that was as of July. There's actually more now than, than are identified on that map. Um, but I also want to say that there's a lot of evidence now that the United States military officers, after the hot war started, very clearly had identified their policy to be one of killing civilians, making no distinction. And the bombings during World War II, both in Germany and in Japan, uh, which made no pretense of distinguishing between civilians and combatants, had really kind of wiped out any notion that there was a genuine concern for killing of civilians. I mean, it really was uh, the firebombing of of Japan hap uh, happened continuously from March through August 15th. And these were all, almost all civilian targets, independent of the two atomic bombs, or the hydrogen bomb and the atomic bomb. Many more people were killed from the fire bombings, all incendiary bombings. Uh, the one, the first night of Tokyo bombings, of conventional bombings alone, probably killed 100,000 people in March of 1945. Uh, so there was no any, there was no longer in our minds a distinction. The matter that we learned in the U.S. Um, uh, warfare handbook, uh, we learned about uh, civilians versus combatants. I had to learn it in my own training. It was not really taken seriously, and clearly wasn't taken seriously in Vietnam. So um, another good book about the history of the war is Halliday and Cummings' book, Korea, The Unknown War, a very excellent, easily readable book, which is pretty, um, um, pretty fair. And uh, it's one of the, one of the few, uh, John Halliday and Bruce Cummings. Uh, Bruce Cummings is a professor at the University of Chicago. He's probably the foremost uh, his academic uh, on Korea in the United States, and he wow. is uh, not an apologist for the United States. And this excellent book that came out two years ago on the history of U.S. germ warfare against North Korea and China. I spent 20 years developing the research in this book to dispel all of the denials all those years that the U.S. had not used uh, biological warfare against the, the North Koreans and the, and the Chinese. In both, both 
north of the Yalu River and south of the Yalu River, which is the border between China and North Korea. Um, so I hesitate to say that Korea was not an aberration, but it was really not an aberration. It just happened to be a terrible tragedy that killed at least five million people, about the same number of people that were killed in Southeast Asia, uh, in the Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Uh, they were unique in the sense that uh, each country lost five million people, which is a lot of people to lose. And uh, in, in fact, the, the North Korean population at the beginning of the war was about nine million people. There were about 21 million living south of the 38th parallel, about 9 million living north. By 1953, it's estimated that one-third of all the North Koreans were dead. That's how much bombing, the bombing of North Korea was continuous and it was saturation bombing. No distinctions and General MacArthur's orders were very clear. Bomb every village, every city, every factory, every town without any regard for whether it was a military target. It's all part of the record. Um, so, but what, what I do think it's important is that people in this country and in other countries understand that the United States policy for a long time, maybe since our, our origins, has had a racist overtone and an ethnocentrism attached to it that has made our policies uh, criminal, cruel, and brutal and that this is not, what happened in Vietnam is not an aberration. What happened in Korea is not an aberration. What's happening in the Middle East is not an aberration or in Iraq or in Serbia or Kosovo. These are not mistakes of judgment. These are part of a long pattern of a insensitivity to other human beings and other popular movements in the world. Uh, the United States policy is basically we control the world's resources and we need them to maintain our way of life. Four and a half percent of the world's population consuming upwards of half the world's resources. Uh, this is not a formula that can be sustained and I suspect many of you understand, maybe even from the power crunch in California, that you know we're coming to the end of our fantasy. Uh, we've been living a fantasy. We have been living a lie. And the tragedy is that many people have died as a result of this lie needlessly. Many species on the planet have died needlessly. And uh, we have to look at our history. We have to look at our soul. We have to look at our ability to see clearly what we're doing, what the consequences of our decisions are, the consequences of our choices, the consequences of our way of life. These gentlemen are here to, to talk about what happened in one part of the world, a tragedy that still isn't much known. Uh, this goes on all the time, and it's time that people in the United States could touch these people and feel their pain so that once we feel the pain, we will be motivated to make changes in the way we think and live. I mean, it's only through, my opinion is, it's not through reason that real change is made, it's through emotions, it's through feelings. It's through feeling the solidarity with other people and feeling the pain that other people experience based on choices and policies that they had nothing to do with, that they are totally uh, innocent of having made those policies. But we can't say that in the United States we're really innocent. We have this long history now that reveals this um, terrible plight that we have inflicted on ourselves and the world. And these, this tribunal that's going to happen in June in New York is in a very important, perhaps early phase of a whole series of truth commissions about U.S. history. This is called the Korea Truth Commission, but it's relating to a, a, what the United States did in Korea. We need a U.S. Truth Commission that starts delving into our entire history about what we've done all over the world so that we can experience perhaps a conversion ourselves, a transformation ourselves that will then enable the world to say, what a relief that this 
big power is now become humble and compassionate and um, has, for the first time, uh, able to see how other people live and the, and the consequences of their choices. So uh, thank you for all coming, and I really thank these Koreans again for being here.